So while the coronary arteries and the coronary veins are controlled from a very particular area in the cerebral cortex, remember the coronary arteries from the cerebral cortex just about here above the right ear, the coronary veins are very close to the left ear. Let's look at the myocardium. The myocardium, that's the heart muscle now, okay? So the, uh, the myocardium, the heart muscle, has two control centers. The heart muscle itself is controlled from the cerebral medulla, which is the interior part of the cerebrum. The heart muscle itself, as I said, is controlled from the cerebral medulla, and we have, I have here the diagrams, a control center for the right and for the left heart muscle. Remember, we had the twisting of the tube, so we do have two halves of the heart. So one half is controlled from one brain hemisphere, the other from the other. I have here a brain scan where I just copied these uh, images on so we can see the cerebral medulla is on a quite low layer of the brain in, but in this area here and then we have the control center uh, in the motor cortex so above here we see much higher level here and the motor cortex controls the pumping motion of the heart so the contraction of the heart okay so we differentiate the heart muscle itself is controlled from the so-called cerebral medulla but the pumping motion of the heart is controlled from the motor cortex that controls all muscles of our body. So the whole skeletal musculature is controlled from the motor cortex, including, of course, the heart muscle with the pumping. Okay, the conflict linked to the myocardium is being completely overwhelmed. So negative stress overload. Does that sound familiar? Yeah? So negative stress overload. So this conflict can refer to any negative overwhelming distress. For example, uh, work-related distress, uh, family or relationship-related distress, money-related distress, and so forth. I think I don't have to explain more. We know what that means. It's just, as we would say in plain English, too much on the plate, too much negative on the plate. Okay, so let's see what happens. Okay, and this is why we learned at the beginning the five biological laws. So we can appreciate why some, some uh, um, uh, tissues make cell proliferation in the conflict active phase in order to assist us during the conflict resolution, while others make tissue loss, like we have seen with the coronary arteries. Okay. So as soon as this overwhelmed conflict occurs, it impacts, in fact, in both brain relays, so in the, in the relay that controls the uh, heart muscle itself and in the motor cortex, and the program is switched on. So during the conflict active phase, we see now necrosis, so tissue loss of the heart muscle. So that's in the active phase. Tissue loss of the heart muscle, and at the same time, since the motor cortex is also controlling that, we have partial paralysis of the heart muscle. So I repeat, the tissue loss of the heart muscle is controlled from the cerebral medulla, and the partial paralysis Analysis of the heart muscle is controlled from the motor cortex. And because of the less tissue, so to speak, of the heart muscle, and because of the partial paralysis of the heart muscle, less blood is pumped to the organ, which causes weakness. Weakness, yeah, because there's less blood in the organ, so to speak, weakness and the shortness of breath, particularly during physical exertion. So if uh, the person is very conflict active, so the conflict activity being really overwhelmed in this conflict active phase, the, this, uh, the person has this weakness and shortness of breath even with slight exertions. Okay, slide during and after exertion. So we want to keep this in mind, my friends, because this is all part of prevention. Because all of a sudden you realize, well, 
you know, I'm not doing well. I'm just very weak. I'm used to run and do things, and now after five uh, uh, steps, I have to sit down, right? Uh, this is already, and we know, of course, this is not abstract. We know we are in an overwhelming situation. But when we have these particular symptoms, we know, ling, 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 hey, my my myocardium, my heart muscle is involved, so I have to slow down. I have to start either delegating or find partial resolutions because if this is going on uh, for a longer period of time, this is going to be uh, potentially difficult. Okay? So again, the symptoms that indicates to us, hey, what is going on in my life is just too much. I got to do something. If it's angina, oh, it's a territorial loss. So we, we know how to calculate. We know what is behind the symptoms. If there is this weakness, right, then um, we know that the myocardium is involved. So what happens during the healing phase? So when, oh, here's a nice CT scan. So this CT scan shows, I have, that's why I have all these diagrams here, conflict activity, we see here the sharp rings, okay, here it goes on, the ring configuration, in the area of the brain that controls the myocardium, in this case it is a CT scan uh, showing the uh, medulla uh, layer, so to speak, okay. So we can basically conclude from a brain scan what is happening on the body level, and from that we can conclude what conflict is linked to it, in what phase the, the person is in, uh, in the program, if it's active, if it's healing. Of course, this is much more complex than I can cover here in a short period of time, but you see the, uh, yeah, the beauty and the science of the work. Okay. So let's look at the healing phase. As soon as the conflict is resolved, the entire organism goes into the healing phase, right? So the heart muscle is now going to be restored. So there will be cell augmentation, and in fact, at the end of the healing phase, the heart muscle will be stronger than before, okay? And this is exactly the, the purpose of the biological program. Just in a nutshell, a little bit of extra information. Dr. Hammer found that all organs and tissues that are controlled from the cerebral medulla, without exception, show the biological purpose at the end of the the healing phase. A very good example is for example a bone. So if you know a bone fracture, if we break a bone, that hurts first of all, but at the end of that healing process, you know what happens, where the, the bone breaks, there will be more tissue, so the, the, the bone is stronger than before, so we don't break it there again. Okay? So the bones, the muscle, the tendons, everything, so to speak, attached to the bones, all this is controlled from the medulla. So the biological purpose is here, yes, yeah, there is a tissue loss of heart muscle tissue in the active phase, but at the end of that process, the heart muscle will be stronger than before, so if we, uh, we uh, perceive or experience again an overwhelmed conflict, there's basically more tissue to work with to begin with. And that is the whole uh, purpose of this program, okay? But we want to, of course, also look, as always, on the brain level. Because as we learned, healing always occurs in, uh, in a fluid environment. So as to be expected, in phase A of healing, we have the brain edema. That's a beautiful scan. We see the brain edema, the water pockets here in dark, in the area of the brain that controls the myocardium. So during the healing phase, there will be the, as I always call it, the obligatory almost brain edema in that area. And of course, as always, we have have to be, uh, think in preventive terms because the sooner we resolve the conflict, remember what we learned before, okay, the, if we slow, uh, downgrade the conflict, if we resolve the conflict as soon as we have a chance, then we prevent basically a large brain edema, which is a healing symptom, a healing process, because only when the large, uh, when the brain edema is large, then the epicrisis, of course, could be potentially quite difficult. And this is exactly what happens uh, during the myocardial attack or heart attack. 
Okay, so the myocardial attack occurs, as we now already, of course, understand, during the epileptoid crisis when this brain edema is pressed out with this sympathicotonic stress push. Remember, at the height of the healing phase, we are in deep vagotonia, and all of a sudden, the whole organism is pulled out of this vagotonic state, put back into a sympathicotonic active phase in order to press this edema out. This is the whole idea. This is the purpose of that. So because afterwards everything can go back to more normal. This is what we want to call the healing crisis. But we, of course, we have to see this in a positive light because this is necessary so everything can go back to normal. So let's look at the details now. So now since the, we're talking about the myocardium, since the motor cortex is involved and controls the whole process, now we're seeing during the epicrisis cramps, okay? Now we're seeing actually muscle cramps of the, uh, 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 of the myocardium because that muscle cramp is controlled from the motor cortex which controls the contraction of the heart. It's like a thunderstorm, it's like an earthquake quick in there and that causes uh, this, this big uh, painful cramping. Okay? has nothing to do with the coronary arteries. Okay? That's why I keep repeating this. This is a real heart muscle cramp. Okay? So depending on the intensity uh, of the epicrisis, which is determined by the intensity of the conflict active phase, right? So depending on the intensity of the epicrisis, this symptom can range from uh, trembling, so from light trembling, to actually very strong uh, convulsions of the heart muscle. At the same time, we have tachycardia, so again, a rapid heartbeat, which is caused by the rapid contraction or contraction of the heart muscle. You see, we have again very uh, distinct symptoms. At the same time, cold sweat, nausea, this is always when uh, uh, epicrisis occurs because the epicrisis is revisiting the conflict active phase. So if we are stressed out, if we are uh, distressed, if we're in conflict active phase, hey, we are nauseous, we can't eat. And over, so we see there is, we have the cold hands, it's a real <laughs> revisit of the sympathicotonic state for the purpose of pressing that edema out. So we really, really uh, recognize uh, the symptoms and what is going on. Okay. Well, well, well. And as we see now, there's absolutely no correlation between a myocardial heart attack and elevated blood pressure and elevated cholesterol as claimed by conventional medicine. Because the myocardium is controlled from the cerebral medulla and from the motor cortex, while elevated cholesterol relates to the coronary veins and the coronary arteries, and the uh, cholesterol level only arises if a biological program is in action. In other words, if one of the two coronary vessels needs to be repaired. So either way it's good, either way it's positive, but there's absolutely no link between the two. And this explains this. About half of the patients who are admitted to hospitals for a heart attack have normal cholesterol levels. Okay? Now we understand. And from now on, my friends, you're going to uh, read the newspapers differently. You read the medical journals differently. Because now you can use German new medicine and you can put that as a, as a background information or front uh, uh, information and now everything falls into place. So if you read this after two hours sitting in here, you know that these people who have heart attacks, who have a normal cholesterol level, have a myocardial attack. And the whole theory that these cholesterol plaques cause the myocardial attack is basically, sorry to say this, out the window. Okay? 
And I'm not cynical. I'm not bashing anybody. I'm not bashing conventional medicine. But I do have a scientific background. And I've learned in my uh, school in Austria, you know, to be precise with our work. If we do this in the humanities, that's fine. But this is not the place, medicine, to do this kind of things because this is about our health and we have to rely on good science. And good science means the established theory has to be reproducible in each and every patient's case. Period. Okay. So next, I'm going to go back for a second. Because next to cholesterol, High blood pressure is also considered a risk of heart attacks. That's basically what's out there. It's high cholesterol or it's high blood pressure. And everybody is in panic. So we cleared and clarified the cholesterol topic. So let's go to the blood pressure. Concentration. The heart muscle it's basically a pressure system designed to pump blood into the two circulatory systems of the body. The right myocardium, so the right heart muscle, pumps blood into the pulmonary circulation, so in other words, to the lungs. While the left myocardium pumps blood into the systemic circulation, in other words, to, uh, to the rest of the body. So I repeat, the lung circulation, that's where it's the name, pumps uh, blood to the lungs. The systemic uh, uh, circulation pumps blood to all or other organs of the body. And since, I have a diagram here, since the distance of blood flow from the heart to the lungs is much shorter than from the lungs to the entire body, the pressure system for uh, the lung circulation is less, or the pressure required uh, for uh, uh, pumping blood to the, to the lungs is less than to the entire body. So all this to say, the pulmonary or lung circulation is a low pressure system and the systemic circulation is a high pressure system. And this uh, correlation, this functional correlation is important so we understand the symptoms that occur during the two heart attacks involving the right or the left myocardium. Okay, here we go. So if the heart attack involves the right myocardium, so I start again, if the heart attack involves the right myocardium, the low pressure system, this is why I have the colors, eh? No, it's, it's, it's new information for you, a little bit you know, on the advanced side. So I start again. If the heart attack involves the right myocardium, the low pressure system is for the time being deficient, resulting in a temporary dominance of the high blood pressure system causing an increase of blood pressure. So in other words, the low pressure system is deficient at the time causing a dominance of the high blood pressure system, high pressure system and as a result the blood pressure shoots up. So during the epicrisis, during the heart attack involving the right heart mus muscle, so the right myocardium, the blood pressure rises, sharply rises. Well, the blood pressure is also elevated during the, because of the partial par paralysis of the heart muscle, the blood pressure is also elevated, elevated during the conflict active phase and during phase A of healing. But the blood pressure is never as high during those two phases than during the actual heart attack. So yes, it is correct that heart attacks are preceded by high blood pressure. But contrary to the standard theory, high blood pressure, uh, uh, high potential high blood pressure doesn't cause the heart attack. High blood pressure is an accompanying symptom caused by the temporary deficiency of the low pressure system. It's not causing it. 
It's a mechanical correction. The low pressure system is out of commission, so to work, so the high pressure system is up, causing the rise of blood pressure. Okay. So there's more or are more symptoms that are uh, part of the right myocardial attack. Because of the blood pressure being high, just think logically, because of the uh, blood pressure being high, there is heart racing. You can imagine, the blood pressure, the heart goes really, really fast, causing what is called tachycardia, and there are strong heartbeats, but, sorry, particularly in the neck area. So it goes really, really fast. So it feels like if the heart were to jump out of the chest. Okay? So all this, my friends, remember everything we're learning here, because this is, for you, an indication that here is an episode linked to the right myocardium. Okay? A little uh, more information later with uh, prevention. Okay? So, but so we can recognize now, aha, uh -huh, this is because of the high blood pressure. Then there is shortness of breath. The shortness of breath when a person has a myocardial attack. Remember when the coronary arteries are involved, the person has angina, right? But whew, nothing wrong with breathing, okay? So the shortness of breath, and here is why. This is absolutely fascinating. What causes the shortness of breath? Well, uh, the right myocardium is functionally closely tied to the left diaphragm, which is the chief muscle of respiration. This is why the heart attack affects breathing. So with an intense heart attack, this can actually cause a complete cessation of breathing. But now something uh, I want to add here and uh, elaborate more about it. The epicrisis uh, typically occurs because it's in vagotone, eh? when it, we are pulled out of that. The epicrisis typically occurs during periods of rest. Okay? This is why when people have heart attacks and strokes and so forth, it's usually when they're relaxing. And often during the night or in the morning hours when we are naturally more at rest. So I repeat so we don't forget and remember this. The epicrisis typically occurs during periods of rest and often during the night. Also, an epicrisis can be a single event, small or big, or, and this is not significant, the epicrisis can also occur in sequences, okay? Uh, just imagine this brain edema has been pressed, has to be pressed out. This can be one big <coughs> push, so to speak, but can, it can all, also go in little uh, sequences or there's little relapses. And so forth. But it can be one event or it can be sequences. Um, uh, uh, nighttime coughing fits would be a good example. Coughing fits are epicrisis. Okay? This is basically, <laughs> since we have a little bit more time today, the, 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 um, the uh, bronchial muscle, okay? we're talking about the bronchial muscle now, so it's the same here, it's this contraction of the, the, the bronchial, so the muscle causing <laughs> causing these coughing fits. It's exactly the same like the heart muscle, but it just happens in the lungs. Okay? So, but you see it's the same principle. So anyway, so uh, these nighttime coughing fits are a good example of these sequences of epicrises uh, during the night. And if this involves, or if it, this involves the myocardium, this results uh, in uh, episodes of cessation or short episodes like coughing fits, in short episodes of cessation of breathing with uh, typical with gasping for air, with uh, um, uh, uh, struggling for breath, and uh, uh, episodes of choking, 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 sorry. And this is what is called sleep apnea. Okay? So sleep apnea, so Dr. Hammer's research shows us, is, or I should say are, small, small, mini heart attacks. Small, mini myocardial attacks involving, of course, the diaphragm that is closely linked to this. In fact, in the brain, the control centers of the diaphragm are 
con uh, exactly underneath the control center of the myocardium. So this is why when this epicrisis occurs, it involves the diaphragm, and this is why usually both organs are involved. And of course, there's the functional uh, connection on the organ level, and this is why when a right myocardial heart attack occurs, there is this shortness of breath, there is this potential cessation of breathing, but if these, uh, let's call it small or medium epicrisis occur in a series that is sleep apnea. So sleep apnea is linked to being completely overwhelmed. That's a revelation, I know. Okay? So people who have sleep apnea, we know and they can learn from that. This is uh, ongoing and ongoing. The conflict is not resolved. There are constantly conflict relapses. During the day, they are in this overwhelmed situation, family, relationship, work, you name it, money, uh, difficult times. And during the night, of course, there's rest, and this is when they have to sleep apnea. And next day, same, same starts again. Okay? So this work, Dr. Hamo's beautiful work, gets us really to the bottom of things, and people do know their conflicts. So if we ask a person uh, that this is linked to being overwhelmed, they know exactly what overwhelmed means in this case. There is a case that was documented in one of uh, Dr. Hamo's books, where a woman had ongoing sleep apnea because of being overwhelmed, concerning her son who has, you know, was involved with drugs and in and out of jail and all these difficult things. But of course, when we, if we don't know that this is linked to a very particular situation in our life, we cannot complete the healing. And for us who know this in advance, and this is why we should know and learn the work as soon as possible, as early as possible, so we are ready when things happen that we know where to put the finger. And this is the psyche, our emotions, yes, our soul. Because that's what the word psyche really means. It means the seat of the soul. The ancient Greek knew this a long time ago. Yeah. Okay, so now we look at the left myocardium. If the heart attack involves the left myocardium, we basically have the uh, opposite scenario. Now the high pressure system is for the time being deficient. As a result, the low pressure system, I should point down, the low pressure system is dominant, causing an instant drop of blood pressure. So exactly the opposite. So when the left myocardium uh, basically goes through the epicrisis, the blood pressure doesn't go up, but drops instantly or very, very fast and, and, and acute, uh, causing in intense cases or in severe cases a complete collapse of the circula circulatory system and person basically is out. Okay? Um, then we also see tachycardia, a fast heartbeat. In this case, uh, the fast heartbeat is caused by uh, the effort of the heart muscle to pump blood into the system, and that causes, of course, a heart racing. And what we see now, there is absolutely no correlation to cholesterol. Okay? So the cholesterol level is in the normal range. And this explains uh, why people have heart attacks with, as we've mentioned before, with a normal cholesterol level. So, my friends, this is such invaluable information. Because we, as learning the work, and we rely on ourselves. Because, as we know, Dr. Hammer's work has been suppressed since the very beginning. So if we are not learn the work in schools, at the university, uh, that medical doctors have a chance to learn this and, and practice this, we are on our own, which is fine. This is why we're here. And learn the work, it's not difficult. The, sim the system is always the same. It's a lot of information, lots of details. But when we understand the principle, then everything falls into place and we can look things up. Okay? You know the difference between a professor and a student? The professor knows where to look things up. That's the only difference. Okay? So, same here. It's just to learn uh, the basics. And most of all, to this make this shift into diseases are 
part of a survival program. So we have the active phase where nature wants to help us out with programs we are all born with. Well, and if you're healing, it's like uh, uh, resting after a big, big battle. Everything has to heal and everything has to go get back to normal. And of course, that takes some time. But the term diseases is, in that sense, in the conventional sense, absolutely incorrect. So this information, my friends, allows us now to conclude from the symptoms what type of heart attack is involved. So if it's the coronary artery-related attack, there is angina pain, stabbing heart pain, the, remember the blood, uh, the, the um, uh, heart rhythm slows down, okay, slows down. Cholesterol level is normal, blood pressure is normal. When the myocardium is involved, well, we have the opposite, right? Uh, we have the, mu the muscle cramps, the heart rate is up, okay? And if the blood pressure shoots up, we know it's the right myocardium. If the blood pressure drops, we know it's the left my myocardium. Okay. And at the same time, and this is the point, we can conclude from the symptoms whether this is related to a territorial loss conflict or a sexual conflict, a eh? territorial loss coronary arteries, sexual conflict coronary vein related attack, or if the conflict is related to being completely overwhelmed. And this is basically prevention at its best, okay? And this takes us to the next point, ice packs, okay? So this is something where the world laughs about Dr. Hammer. He with his ice cubes, okay? But ice cubes are a lifesaver if somebody has a heart attack. Okay, and I'm going to explain those. And this is why, um, you know, always make sure you have your ice, ice cubes in, in the freezer, maybe some packages of frozen peas or anything like it, because this is what is going on. Okay? When we understand that the heart attack is actually a quote unquote brain event, that the, in the magnitude of the heart attack is uh, uh, determined by the size of that brain edema, then we realize that we can, we have to focus on that brain edema as far as, you know, the heart attack is concerned. So first of all, if you're present when somebody has a heart attack, of course we have to phone 911. That's important, okay? However, there are emergency measures or one emergency measure that is helpful uh, in order to get the situation in control, into, under control, which is cooling the head, putting ice packs on the head. Because by cooling the head or with cooling the head, the brain edema becomes smaller. As a result, the brain pressure is less. And as a result, the heart attack is much less serious. And this is how Dr. Hammer puts it. This way, we can reduce the mortality rate of heart attacks easily to less than half. And I do have a testimonial for that, uh, which I received uh, about a year and a half ago, a gentleman from the United States uh, was uh, sending me this letter, which I'm going to share with you. He wants to stay anonymous. The, uh, the um, uh, testimonials is on the website too, as well, but uh, I would like to share this, talking about ice cubes. Okay, we'll read this together. Hi, Caroline. I wish to share with you an experience of mine. About a year and a half ago, I was, sitting, I was visiting my mother, 87 years of age. We were talking about old times. She then began complaining that her left arm was hurting, then pain spread up to her jaw and chest, a heart attack. Which type of heart attack? Coronary arteries. That's why she has angina. This is why it radiates. So we know now which type of uh, attack she had. I asked her if she felt any pain in her head. She affirmed on the right side above the ear. I ran to the freezer, grabbed a pack of frozen fish, and <laughs> held it against the right side above the ear. She went into shock. 
Meanwhile, I wanted to call 911, but she refused to go to the hospital. She, she said she wanted to die at home. I thought to myself, Hama had better be right about this. <laughs> In about three or four minutes, she sat up straight and said she was feeling better. I continued to hold the ice to her head for another 15 minutes. After this, it was as if nothing had happened. In fact, she said that she felt much better than before the heart attack. I then fixed her cup of black tea and cooled it off with ice cubes. <laughs> it has been a year and a half now, and she has had no further heart problems. I'm CPR certified, but no amount of CPR or defibrillators would have saved her had the swelling not gone down in the brain. Speaking with my CPR instructor, he said that CPR saves about 1 in 10 heart attack victims. Perhaps CPR really doesn't save anybody. Perhaps the brain swelling would have diminished anyways in these cases. Your website saved my mother's life. Thank you. <laughs> but my friends, I'm trying to do my very best with conveying this beautiful work. But the fact is, I'm just a messenger. And the thank you and all the credit only goes to one man who deserves the applause.